uh, Ritu Menon and um, the publishing house that we started in 1984 was Kali for Women and now what I run is uh, an offshoot of Kali, a sort of successor organization called Women Unlimited. Mm. So um, I like to think of it as Kali for Women Unlimited, mm. which is uh, continuing with the same work, with the same kind of publishing, with the same link with the movement here, which I think is still very strong mm. in terms of looking at movements uh, internationally, uh, looking at the women's movement internationally. I see it as being uh, more active and certainly much more, um, how should I put it, uh, needed. Mm. I think it's needed everywhere, but mm. it's certainly needed here. Mm. You used to have come to Piri. We used to work with them okay. in the mid 80s. Yeah, that was mm. before my time. You no, know, I'm sure, but yeah. we, they were there. It yeah. was a very interesting. It was two women, okay. and they, it, you know what Kantapiri is. So it, it's tropic of, it's the tropic of um, Capricorn, I think, or maybe it's the tropic of Cancer. I don't remember exactly which. But in any case, what it meant was that they were interested in literature that came from the countries of the south, okay. not the north. So Kantupiri was, um, in that sense, um, you know, uh, an indication of their, of their interest. And we did some very nice things with them. You know, there used to be a feminist book fair yeah. in the 80s. Yeah. Uh, the first one was in 1984 in, uh, in, in England. And the second one was in Norway, in Oslo in 86 and there were five there were five feminist book fairs from 84 to 1994 oh, okay. and the last one was held in Australia and they used to be they would rotate okay. there was no fixed uh, address there was no headquarters there was no secretariat it was just women in different parts of the world who decided that they would host the fair and then they raised the money for it and they invited writers and booksellers and librarians and publishers, everyone in the book trade who was feminist. Everything that was uh, run and uh, organized by women. And it was a, it was a very uh, amazing um, phenomenon because it went on for 10 years, but it was never a fixed organization, never. So Kantapiri is a group that, uh, I mean, these two women are women that we met through the feminist book fairs. And for years, it would be the same women and a few more who would gather at the fair. And it was a very, very supportive, it was solidarity, yeah. Yeah. but it, is, it was also business. It was also publishing, it was meeting writers, it was exchanging, it was uh, collaborating, it was supporting each other. And it was very, very important for the feminist presses then. There were many more then than there are now. There are hardly any now in, in the world. But then there were a lot. And, you know, the, the feminist book fairs would have 600, 800 women, which was um, now unthinkable. I mean, now we can't really imagine that scale mm. of feminist enterprise. Mm. And of course, there were a lot of other publishers who said, oh, we want to be there, we want to be there. But, you know, it was understood that mm. this was really a, a very particular thing um, and a very particular uh, meeting place for, uh, for women in the book trade. So, um, you know, it's a pity that uh, all that is now, you know, a thing of the past. Mm. Yes, we started in 1984 and the Feminist Book Fair started in 1984. And that was just a coincidence? That I think it was just a coincidence, yeah. yes. It was not by design at all because mm. we were here and the Feminist Book Fair was in London. But it was very much a part of the international women's movement. Uh, and I think that internationalism was something that was very, uh, uh, very alive at the time across Europe, across North America. Um, you know, partly in the south, there were presses in, uh, in Chile, in Brazil, um, in India, of course. Uh, there, you know, so it was a, 
there was a kind of um, uh, a kind of community yeah. uh, which um, which made this possible, mm -hmm. which uh, and which grew mm -hmm. as a result. So it was a very um, you know a, a very give and take kind of uh, of experience. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, you know, it was the beginning mm -hmm. of a lot of work mm -hmm. that was being done in the women's movement on literature, in fiction, in non-fiction, in politics, in politicizing, in consciousness raising, in theory, uh, building, in, in exploring new areas, in breaking the old uh, definitions. There was a lot happening in women's studies, there was a lot happening in, in the women's movement, the, uh, the black women's movement, the Asian women's movements, the Latin American, the African. Uh, it was a post-60s uh, movement. The women's movement was a post-60s movement. So it had that um, ideological, if you like, um, bone in it, mm -hmm. uh, the spine, yeah. uh, which was to make social change. And feminist publishing was a project of social change. It was not about money. It was not about being commercially successful. It was about using a medium the medium being publishing, in order to effect some kind of social change. So the publishing always had that, it still does wherever it exists, but it had a very clear objective and its links with the women's movement were very strong. That's what actually made the feminist book fair happen. That was its, its background, that's what, that's what uh, you know, um, that's what the politics um, gave expression to because of course uh, if you have the medium and if you control that medium as we all know uh, you can control the message and it was the message of the mainstream that the women's movement was trying to change or was trying to give a new definition to so the idea was always to to intervene and to make an impact on the mainstream but from a position of strength, that is to say from a position where you control the medium, because if you don't control the medium, you are not sure how the message will be communicated. So that, mm. you know, that connection was always, uh, in, in a sense, very much more important than the commercial uh, success, if you like. Of course, it became so successful that it got taken over by the mainstream. There are hardly any feminist presses now. They're just very much, uh, you know, they've been absorbed. You see, it's, it's very difficult to remain uh, outside it here because the, the kind of work we do draws on the issues that the movement is concerned with a great deal. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, very, um, it's a very dynamic relationship. So, you know, we don't see ourselves as publishers in the, in the accepted sense of the term alone. We do see ourselves as intervening. And one of the ways of intervening is to be activist. Now, you can't be an activist in the same way if you're not part of a movement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we are part of campaigns, we are part of uh, uh, resistance, we are part of protests, we are part of discussions on issues. And all that is an activity that is uh, that uh, we don't see as being outside mm -hmm. the the publishing. It's very much a part of it. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, um, the movement is still a uh, you know a real part of the um, of the work. I think that link in in the West, or shall I say in the North, is much less clear. Mm -hmm. In fact. I don't think in the UK there's a single feminist press left. There's Virago, but it's owned by the mainstream. France, nothing. Germany, maybe there's one still in Germany, mm. but only one. Mm. Australia, one. The US, maybe three or four. So there's hardly anything mm. left. And that's what we've seen over the last uh, 20 or 25 years, that as this area of um, uh, it, it's not always feminist, but a related word which is gender. Mm -hmm. 
which is what you know they prefer to use in uh, the academic uh, kind of writing and publishing that has definitely been taken over and like the west the non academic which is to say the general interest what is called the mass market has been taken over by the mass market by the big publishers now in india over the last 7 or 8 years or maybe 10 years there's been a huge entry of multinational corporations multinational publishing houses so they obviously are interested in mopping up whatever they can and among them uh, the, the i mean there's zero politics there's the politics of the marketplace maybe but there isn't any it what 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 it ends up being is that the women's movement becomes a marketable product minus politics so of course that's what happens very often if the mainstream begins to to see it as being profitable as long as it's not profitable it's not uh, it's not worth bothering about as long as it's not a threat either to business or to changing social relations it's not worth bothering about but when it begins to affect both these these aspects that is to say culture and society and politics then the best way to deal with it is to take it over because obviously some amount of neutralizing takes place that's an old tactic so you keep resisting as i say if we didn't have a very strong movement and yeah. if that link wasn't there mm -hmm. um it would be very much more difficult to keep going but as i say you know here because uh, till very recently publishing was not uh, not carried out in the same way as it is in the same fiercely competitive way as it is in the north let's say um for many reasons historical and other economic and so on so for a small independent publisher it was still possible mm. to be in the same uh, in the in the same market and survive because th the kind of of work that we are doing the kind of publishing that we do the kind of writing and ideas that we explore are always pushing at the edge so it takes about 10 years for the others to get there do you know what i mean mm -hmm. so you do all the development work that yeah. is you take the risk yeah. risk is only taken by the small people risk is not taken by the the big guys once the return has been assured and the risk is no longer a risk it will be uh, it will be uh, it will make sense for them so this is what i'm saying and this is still the case more or less it is still the case so what it means is that we are always having to be some steps ahead and take the risks that you know if you if you lose you don't lose as much um and if you if you gain you don't gain as much either but you're willing to take the risk so that's the difference between being small and surviving here and not being able to take that risk uh, now in the north or the west it's not i think it's very difficult so survival for the small uh, feminist press i think is a real challenge um certainly there and the fact that they haven't been able to keep themselves going mm. is not because they didn't try but because really with the you know the decline of the left worldwide has made mm. a very big difference to our kind of work our kind of politics social movements uh, resistance and so on until that you know till that tide turns it will be difficult mm. maybe it will turn i mean who knows almost every book that we publish is risky mm. if you like because you have to in a sense um believe that there will be a reader for it there are any number of uh, of books kinds of books that we we publish that uh, a mainstream publisher simply wouldn't uh, wouldn't take on because they would say we have to be sure of selling a minimum so many hundred copies if we can't be sure of selling so many we're not going to do it our decision is will this book still be selling 10 years from now and if it will 
it's worth doing now. It's worth taking that risk. We are not sure that it will continue to sell 10 years from now. But what we found over the years, over these last 10, 15, 20 years, is that almost all the books that we risked, mm -hmm. because the issue was too new, it was too radical, it was too, uh, too sort of different, those books have been reprinted and reprinted and reprinted because it takes, often takes that long for society to catch up or to acknowledge an issue, to acknowledge uh, a story, to acknowledge a life, to acknowledge uh, an enterprise. Let's say we did something very unusual. We started publishing oral histories of women in resistance movements. Nobody was willing to do it in the mainstream because they said oral history, completely unreliable. There's no such thing. How can you have a historical record that is based only on women's memories? It will never pass muster. It will never be accepted, not valid. Today, oral history is a discipline that is not only acknowledged but has been validated as being an extremely important corrective to traditional historiography. But when we did it, no one else was willing to do it. They were not willing to think of it as a potentially, uh, n not just uh, economically valid, but valid in as methodology, as a research tool. So I'm saying it's that kind of risk we published a series of pamphlets on key feminist concepts gender, patriarchy, masculinity, feminism itself in a question answer format. Everyone said, well this is really silly, who's going to be, who's going to be, how can you simplify these very complicated, very sophisticated concepts? So, uh, it, you know, the, the author is somebody who is an activist, works very closely with women's groups, works on the ground, is, um, you know, knows the difficulty of communicating difficult concepts to women she's working with. She said, well, you know, okay, we'll try. Uh, we published those pamphlets in almost as soon as we began. So that would be 85 or 86, that's 25 years now or 26 years. We are reprinting them to this day. I don't know how many tens of thousands have been used. And they go very far because they are passed around. They are translated into many languages. They are used on the ground by women who are actually uh, trying to make the change that we are only writing about or we are only publishing. But a, a regular publishing house publishing pamphlets, it was unheard of. They said, it's simply not something that, I mean, why would you bother? You can't price them properly, there's no profit, there's no return. It doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to them, but it made great political sense to us. That it's made very great economic sense is a, is a, is a bonus. Do, do you see? Yeah. The, the decisions are based on something else. The decisions are made on what we think is important to publish. Mm -hmm. And if it, if it succeeds in many ways, different ways, money is not the only um, indicator of success, if it changes the methodology, if it changes the way history or politics or sociology or anthropology begins to look at certain issues, that's successful. So that's, I suppose, those are the kinds of risks mm. that are involved in the choices you make. Mm. Of course, that has a huge uh, impact on whether you survive or not. Because if all the risks you take turn out to be losing ones, how will you survive? But there are things happening in the country, mm. you know, there's globalization happening, it has a huge impact on women, we mm. write about it. Yes. And we're going to be doing a book this month. Mm. by a, a very well-known environmentalist and ecologist, Vandana Shiva, who has also been published in, in Scandinavia. Mm. And um, it's called Making Peace with the Earth. And it's about, you know, the war of the corporate world on the Earth's natural resources. And we think it's going to have a huge impact. It already has, because 
she is in any number of movements any number of people's networks resisting this worldwide so it's not difficult for us to say that this is a book that but what i can say is that the kind of challenges she's she's throwing out to the corporate world the kinds of names she's naming the big business houses that she is she is taking on would be a risk for a lot of publishers they simply wouldn't want to tangle with those people because they don't want to be slapped with all kinds of of um, legal cases so we are saying well okay it's a chance you take it's a chance you take and if it happens you know i don't think we'll be able to survive it if it does happen but somehow there is a way by which i don't know at least in india it's not very easy for this to be swept under the carpet you know there would be a whole resistance to it do you see what i mean yeah. there would be Absolutely. there would be a response if something like that were to happen i mean mandana herself will take them to court and she has enough material to take them to court and i think they know it so it's it's that kind of uh, i don't know how to say it but chance that you take but it's a calculated risk if you know what i mean yeah. it's not a it's not a stupid risk mm. it is very important politically yeah to to uh, communicate this as widely as possible not simply that you know um that uh, the bandana is, is in court against multi brand retail or she's in court against xyz that's that she does anyway but what's our role our role is to see if we can disseminate it widely among people she may not reach so it's that kind of uh, you know uh, how should i put it uh, this kind of collaborative work mm. the, the book is being published simultaneously in south africa in australia uh, in india of course that is south asia and hopefully in the uk and the us as well so it means that you are able to reach that message uh, in a way that uh, hopefully will have some some sort of response of the positive kind not the yeah. negative Inspired, kind no. <laughs> yeah. a couple of other publishers uh, i won't name the countries uh, did decline because they said it's you know it's a little bit too of a risk mm. yeah, i mean it's not a risk that they felt they could take mm. maybe they would take it on something else that's entirely possible yeah. and that that's the decision that you know each uh, organization makes for itself I mean people know us now because we've been there for so long so that's uh, you know they could get in touch um, independently but we also try to keep a uh, track of who's doing what and at what stage it is uh, their work is at and sometimes we develop work with them um and you know this is a very uh, this is a very uh, exciting part mm. of the work is that you are able really to shape something and to to be part of that process as well and there are several books that we've done like that uh, linking issues linking religion and development for example linking media and development linking conflict with uh, with uh, national policy linking militarization with sexism you know there are I mean, now these are not uh they are sort of overlapping issues they are not straightforward in the sense that you can't it's not easy to find material that will address any of this directly or in a in a you know complete way but if you let's say we we say that we want to do something on militarization and um violence against women well you almost have to create that work there is there is experience on the ground there are people who have been talking about it thinking about it maybe even writing a little bit about it but there's not there's not enough for it to so you you actually try and put it together i remember doing a book on peace on women's uh, peace efforts uh, across uh, south asia because at uh, you know at at one point in the mid 90s and actually even now the whole region is in conflict there is not a single country in south asia which is not in conflict and which has not been in conflict for 10 or more years 
ten or more. It's a very long time for a conflict. And in, in that kind of situation, there has been a lot of peace work by women. What is that work is what we wanted to find out. So, you know, you, you, you initiate that project, if you like, or you initiate that, that bringing together of experience and of analysis and of reflection. And that makes a, a book. I mean, it's so in a sense, it's like really like making it uh, to censorship, a huge issue, but not state censorship, not censorship that comes formally, but all the forms of censorship that women experience that are not formal, that are social, that are cultural, that are familial, that, uh, you know, that women censor themselves. So what we tried to do was to look at all those forms of censorship that come into play much before any formal censorship. So they don't, formal censorship does not need to function. It has already been taken care of by the family, by the community, by religion, by society, by the woman herself, by her husband, by her father, by her son maybe, who knows. So, in, and we, we did, you know, about, uh, we worked with about 300 women writers. That was not publishing, but it, it was about women's writing. Uh, 300 writers in 10 languages because we have 22 languages here. So we couldn't do all, but we did. It was a huge thing. Mm. Now, no publisher would do that mm. because that's not part of their, uh, mm. their, of their mandate, if you like. They cannot do it. It's not possible for them to do it. But for us, it was very much a part of the project of retrieving women's writing and to find out the circumstances in which they write. What's the establishment? What's the literary establishment? What's the context? in which they are writing. How is that writing received? Who decides? All of those questions were part of this. Uh, it took, um, it took what, about eight years? That you can't, these are long-term projects, you know, with a very long gestation. So no one invests that kind of time. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that for us it was very important and we produced some wonderful material anthologies of poetry, long interviews with women, which had never been done before. They are, uh, you know, those things are a benchmark. That is, they establish a kind of what they say, a baseline. From there you can move on. You can do all kinds of, uh, of work following from that. Whether we do it or someone else does it, the, the foundation has been uh, laid in a way. No one else was doing it, but it was something that I think was very much a part of the feminist project. The workshops were about how women are censored and how they write, yeah. and so what they write and how they choose and what form they write in and what space they have for it. Mm. That was it. It was just discussions. Mm. Yeah. It was just an exchange and an opening up of the issue. Mm -hmm. And of course, most of them said, oh, we've never been censored. Mm -hmm. And then, by the end of the mm -hmm. meeting, they said, of course, we have been censored from the day we started. Mm -hmm. In all these ways, we don't have time, we have, you know, domestic uh, preoccupations, we don't have space, um, we can't write about X, we can't write about Y. Um, we have to take permission, mm. all sorts of things. Mm. Two weeks ago I met one of the writers who had been in one of our workshops in Bangalore in, uh, in 2001 or two, I can't remember, and she said, you know, uh, I have now got some stories and will you publish them? Mm. But at the time we didn't think of it in that mm. sense, you know, we didn't think, oh, here are 300 writers and we can, you know, because of course we couldn't possibly publish them all. But the fact that five or eight or nine or whatever feel that there is a forum mm. in which this work is welcome and is understood is very important. And also the empowerment that you can do. That you can. No, that so there is a community mm. in which this work mm. will be received. Yeah. 
Of course, there is a very large community in the country, but that's a very different thing. That's not quite the same because this is a community of sympathy and solidarity. And that's very much a movement uh, value. It's not necessarily a value in the market. So it's, it's, it's a sort of, uh, um, it's, it's creating a space that is a hospitable space. Which is, um, which I think is a very, uh, it's a very welcome thing for a lot of women because they write us, because they work in isolation. They don't have communities that are ready made. And they found, we, these workshops that we did were residential. So two and a half days to three days, you had to leave your house and come. Mm. You had to live with the other women. And they said they had never had that kind of time to themselves to speak and to discuss their writing. We identify a work mm -hmm. or an author and then we identify a translator and we do maybe at most three or four a year, mm -hmm. at the most. Mm -hmm. You can't do more than that. It's very difficult to get good translations. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think we probably do more non-fiction mm -hmm. than anyone else either. Mm -hmm. So autobiographies, memoirs, mm -hmm. political writing, um, in translation. Mm. That's very important as well. Mm. But as I say, it's a very long-term thing. That's another quite long-term mm. and sometimes it can take two or three years mm. before yeah, you yeah, get a course. single book, you know, so mm. it's, it's a, I mean, it's a very major, mm. majorly uh, significant work, but we do only a certain amount. I'd mm. say maybe it's about 25% of what we do or maybe a little less. Mm. That's, yeah. uh, that's something that uh, it, it's, a, it's purely a labor of love. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's got very little, I mean, it's very important to mm -hmm. do it because I think it's one of the most exciting regions in the world for new writing and for, for being able to understand what is happening in those societies and in those cultures without being fed a very, um, a very controlled information. Uh, from really for us from the West and the North because that is the, the, the route that we receive uh, all this information from. It is, it's, you know, we have very old historical and cultural links with this region. So for us not to be able to have a direct exposure to it is a pity. So really that was the beginning of this. That there is some wonderful material coming out of there. It's not easily available because it's quite difficult to get translations from Arabic into English. But one should make a beginning. And we started with Palestine, which is a, a, a country with whom we have very old links. We were one of the first countries to recognize Palestine. And for years we were not allowed to visit Israel. The two countries we could never visit were Israel and South Africa. I mean, you couldn't, it was stamped on your passport that you cannot visit these two countries because of their politics. And we were the first to recognize Palestine. So I thought, I mean, it's an obvious, it's still politically a very, very important cause in, uh, in India. And so is a lot of the Arab region, excluding Saudi Arabia, of course, which is really, I mean, the pits. But the rest of that region, has been very important. Egypt for non-alignment, Syria and Jordan, Morocco, I mean that, that whole. And we have always published from there. We have published Moroccan writers, Egyptian writers, um, Iraqi writers. So it just seemed, but you know, single, uh, single works as and when. So it just seemed like it's about time that it had a focus, mm -hmm. you know, that you, you presented it mm -hmm. as something that has been conceived in that way. Mm -hmm. So that's arabesque, I mean, that's the... And actually, it's, it is, like all things, or like all, or like many such ventures, these are personal relationships that happened, maybe by accident, maybe a little bit by design, but that have culminated in something concrete. So that's what, uh, what that's about. And I think it's been very, it's been very wonderful 
to do it and we will continue to do it whether or not it succeeds mm -hmm. commercially it's very important as a project mm -hmm. for us to be able to do that and to be able to present this right and i think that it's had it's had some impact mm -hmm. because if you do it i think if you do it in a in a sort of systematic way mm -hmm. it begins to acquire a profile it gets an identity and people begin then to to um, acknowledge it if you like and maybe if we can create some curiosity and 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 change the you know the perspective it will be very important just make a corrective to all the political misinformation that mm -hmm. uh, gets thrown about and believed and reproduced and then you know perpetuated mm -hmm. so that uh, you know after a certain amount of time you don't even know what your what you believe anymore yeah. i mean there are amazing books in themselves that memoir from abu ghraib of that iraqi woman who was jailed by saddam yeah. because she was a communist is an amazing document as a prison memoir i don't think i've read anything like it and she is an amazing woman amazing if ever you go to london you meet her she's uh, she can never go back to iraq mm. but uh, the work she does for iraqi solidarity is uh, with iraqi women in exile in england is uh, extraordinary so i'm saying with that kind of politics and that kind of steadfastness in the face of huge resistance you have to honor it you know there's no way you can so if people read her work i think it's wonderful and she has only been published by feminist presses by the way by the way how does one respond to this is the important thing it was a feminist press that found her it was a feminist press that found river ben the iraqi blogger who wrote about the invasion uh, in 2003 it's a palestinian woman who has written about the israeli blockade of gaza which we will be publishing now uh, in 2 or 3 months it's the women it's the feminist presses the few that still remain i think as long as that work gets done it's uh, we still have a reason to be uh, around mind you it's difficult here you know we're a very insular country we were always looking at ourselves or we're looking at what new york does and what london does and what paris does and you know it's everything must come via the west mm -hmm. so to create a space for this kind of writing in this uh, in this culture is not easy because there is a sort of you know a skepticism about it if you like or even just a disinterest mm. so first you create the interest and then you you in a sense you direct that interest mm. to something very particular i mean we're not um, we're not sort of publishing any old thing that comes out it is a very particular um, message if you like or experience mm. or point of view that we want to communicate mm. so you you you're doing uh you know the challenge is to do both to create the interest and then to direct it mm. uh, there's a lot of new writing on caste on sexuality on disability on i mean a lot of children stuff we don't do children's books but there's a lot there so there's you know it's a huge mm. area and how do you choose how do you well you decide what you can afford to mm. do what you think you can you can uh you know you can sell what you think you can circulate what you think is is necessary to do i mean we decided we, we didn't want to do children's books because they are very expensive mm -hmm. uh the marketing is very different the margins are very small and we just didn't think we could do it mm -hmm. i'm not that it's not important mm -hmm. it's very mm -hmm. important but we just decided but there are others who who would say well we wouldn't do something like arabesque but we will do children's books mm -hmm. you know so it it's that kind of mm -hmm. choice mm. so i guess for the future just hope to keep survive really mm. that's uh, not just for the uh, arab list but mm. for the whole mm. uh, the whole of the program 
Who are your readers? We have no idea. No <laughs> idea. We have no one. No one knows who the readers are. Yeah. I mean, but we we think we hope that it is society at large. It's certainly specific groups of women for specific areas of work or specific interests. But uh, who that reader is, we don't. You know, we only get feedback, but mm. you get feedback that is very small. Mm. You know, how do you know worldwide who reads what you... Mm. You get letters, you get responses, you get, you know, from sales figures that somebody is mm. buying, whether they are reading or not, we don't know. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> we know if, that they read only if we get feedback. Mm. So it's, it's very difficult to say who that reader is. That there is a very large pool of readers or potential readers, we think uh, there is. Mm. I'm not sure we reach them all, mm. but you know, I think they're there. Mm. That's what people said when we started, where's your reader? Mm. Who's going to buy your books? So in a sense, you know, just as you create an interest, you develop the market, mm. you develop that audience. Mm. I don't know who reads Arabesque, mm. but from the feedback you get, you you think that yes, there are some readers out there who are uh, who are interested, and who might pass the word around. So a lot of the academic work has had a huge impact. Mm -hmm. The the women's studies, the the more academic, that is to say, the social science, which is still the main work mm -hmm. that we do, has had a very long impact, very far-reaching. So much so that those issues are now taken for granted. But when we started out. No one thought that you linked development with religion of all things. You, de you linked it with economic policy. You didn't link it with religion. Religion had no place in economics. Well, till they realized that there's a huge, you know, non-delivery happening uh, because half the population is not being addressed. And they're not being addressed for very good reasons, you know. There's a whole lot of assumptions that have been made about them. There are a whole lot of, of constraints with which they, under which they live and function. And if you don't understand them, you don't really know where your policy is going. So it's that kind of, you know, you, you, uh, you learn to look at impact in a different way. I think that's something that feminism has done, you know, how do you measure your outcome? Mm -hmm. How do you measure impact? How do you measure the effectiveness of economic uh, growth, for example? Labor, housework, it's never calculated. The contribution women make to housework is never calculated. If you had to pay for it, what would it add up to in terms of your economics? That's feminism. If women counted, we would have a very different economic policy. So it, it, I mean, that impact is huge, meaning you can never go back from that. You can't pretend that you didn't know that women work. Even if they are not paid, they work. It's, it's, a, it's a very big shift. It's a very big shift. So. If you, if you can provide the data for it, if you can continue to develop that, it's, it's, a, it's a huge contribution to, uh, to policy. So I think that's the way in which you, you understand the uh, impact of the very slow, mm -hmm. very long-term, incremental work that is done uh, on these issues, which are all social. These are not women's issues. Yes, if it contributes to policy, if it, you know, it's a big question in the women's movement here. How much should you collaborate with the government? Mm -hmm. The same government that is introducing policy that is leading to women's increasing poverty. Mm -hmm. Should you collaborate with that government mm -hmm. as feminists, mm -hmm. as a women's movement? It's a very big debate. Mm -hmm. You, yeah. you engage in a dialogue. Yeah. You, you be part of the debate. You raise the debate. Mm -hmm. After all, how did the debate come about? It was precisely in response to legislation to say sex work is work. There's a big difference of opinion within the women's movement on this. But it's a debate. That's why we did the book. 
what's the debate and how should one then negotiate not just with our government but with governments across the world where this is a very big issue is it legal is it not what are the implications of making it of criminalizing it and is it a, is it a women's issue or is it not is it a feminist issue or not and how does one uh, deal with the state on an issue like this we find a person who has been involved and uh, knows the issue mm -hmm. in some depth to put together yeah the current thinking in the movement and theoretically mm -hmm. on the issue yeah. and so you know there's a series of these there are six or seven yeah. which have dealt with with critical issues mm -hmm. in the movement here but critical issues also for analysis and of course for then what kind of policy you demand or you hope to get it, the links as i said the links are quite clear yeah. here you know this sex work it's not possible for us to for the women's movement to to look at this issue in isolation from the groups that are working with sex workers on transgender it's not possible on uh, you know queer and uh, and uh, and gay issues not possible unless you're linked with movements mm -hmm. uh, with the work on the ground and that uh, as i say i think that that link here is still pretty strong mm -hmm. i don't see it in the same way in uh, you know in a lot of countries where they think where the battle has been waged and won and there really we don't need to but i'm saying wages for housework is a battle that is still ongoing equal pay for equal uh, equal pay for equal work is still a battle that is ongoing and although some parts of the world are better scandinavia for example is better than many others it's still not as it should be because if it were we wouldn't be seeing the kind of inequality we do nor would we be seeing the kinds of policies we do we wouldn't be seeing this corporatization uh worldwide mm. transnational mm. uh in the way that we do uh today one has to see that as that glass as half full and not half empty mm. because if you see it as half empty you will just give up mm. so one can't give up of course you have to continue in whatever it is even if mm. it is half empty you, you mm. continue so that's why i say it's 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 that mm. um it's very difficult to be optimistic but it's even worse to be pessimistic mm. so it's that kind of uh, you know no choice mm. uh, situation so of course you keep going and there are always small victories mm. and small victories maybe will add up mm. uh, but it you see you can't you you can't keep silent that is death you have to keep raising your voice you protest is very important if you if you don't say you don't like what's happening you have no business to not like it when it happens so the thing is that i think that for all social movements and certainly the women's movement is one of the social movements you just have to keep going i mean just have to keep resisting if you can do it together even better here the women's movement has lots of alliances with other social movements which is another distinguishing thing which is another thing that keeps it going because it has links with many other social movements human rights civil liberties environment shelter health peace anti nuclear anti militarized all these all people's movements peasants so it's not one struggle let's say it's many struggles and you forge links with those struggles because almost all of them are moving for some sort of social change there being women from the fish worker struggle and the tobacco worker struggle and the miners you know you wouldn't think well is this women's movement but as you see from that of course it is because the men may be catching the fish but it's the women who are selling them mm. and it may be the men who are smoking the cigarettes but it's the women who are rolling them 
So the, the links with those movements or with the trade union movement are very important for the women's movement and for the other movements. So I think that, you know, we are all, I suppose, as optimistic or as pessimistic as the next movement. <laughs>